All right, good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started since it is 631. Um, thank you for joining us. This is the Union County Wildlife Chapter. We're located in Monroe, North Carolina, if you're from a different part of the state. Thank you for um, being part of this virtually and in person for everyone who is here in person. Tonight, our guest speaker is Denise Alther. She is from the PD National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and she will be speaking on beavers. So I'll go ahead and turn that over to her and let her introduce herself a little bit more. Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, first of all, just a little disclaimer. I am here, uh, I do work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, specifically the PD National Wildlife Refuge in Wadesboro, North Carolina. Um, however, I am here more on a personal level tonight and just any of my interpretation of what I am speaking about in no way represents the policies of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and or PD National Wildlife Refuge. So, leave it to beavers. <laughs> when we think of beavers, we either think of a furry mammal who is very industrious at building their dams and their lodges, or we think of them as nothing more than a nuisance rodent. A large rodent is exactly what they are, weighing close to 50 pounds at maturity. I personally like to think they were one of our first refuge managers. To understand the evolution of beavers in our environment, as most things, we need to look at history first. Um, it's historically estimated in the early 1800s, there were approximately 400 million beavers occupying this continent. They had created millions of wetlands that don't exist today for many reasons, but basically the wetlands decreased as the beaver population decreased. By the mid 1800s, due to our trading business, Beavers were virtually extinct. Beaver pelts were one of the top economic resources for the colonists, third only to timber and whaling. The Northwest Company, NWC, was the largest fur trading company based in Montreal, Canada. If we look at this slide here, you can see the value of what a beaver pelt was worth. On the right, we see examples of their values. One MB represents a large beaver pelt that is cleaned and stretched. So in looking at this, the indigenous people wanted what the colonists had. The colonists wanted those beaver pelts. So for example, one beaver pelt brought in one brass kettle. Uh, one beaver pelt brought in eight knives. So it was a very lucrative business for both. And one might wonder, what exactly were they doing with these beaver pelts? Why did the colonists want these beaver pelts? The main interest for the beaver pelts was a fashion statement. They were taking the beaver pelts, exporting them back to England to produce top hats that were so such a popular fashion statement of the time. It could take up to five full-grown male pelts to create just one hat. They would use the dense underfur called beaver wool. It is able to be felted and shaped into hats. And because of what it was, the top hats were virtually water repellent. That fashion statement continued into the 20th century in both the US and abroad. Um, however, during that time, America had started to snap out of its apocalypse. They were starting to realize with the help of naturalists and conservationists that it was important to save um, the beavers for our environment. So although we see Teddy Roosevelt here um, and Teddy Roosevelt in some of typical Teddy Roosevelt style was do what I say, but not necessarily what I do. Um, He's wearing his top hat. He was very much a hunter. He liked to uh, go out and hunt big game. Um, however, 
He also had some friends like John Muir who tried to convince him of other ways to think. Uh, this is actually, you know, was quite a, a, history will say that this was quite a very extensive conversation that went on between the two of them um, with Yosemite on the, the ridges of some of the mountain areas there in Yosemite, uh, with John Muir trying to tell of the virtue of nature and knowing that Teddy Roosevelt had some impact on with influential people that he knew um, in his life. So that was always something that John Muir was hoping Teddy Roosevelt would listen to. It actually was the beginning of a change. Uh, in Teddy Roosevelt's time prior to him, in 1872 was the designation of Yellowstone. And no, I am not that old, but... <laughs> Um, so the designation of Yellowstone was one of the first public lands that was taken and given to the, um, the government took and helped to preserve it. Although at that time it wasn't logistically a national park, the government was helping to protect it. In 1900, the Lacey Act was put into place which was actually to help protect fish, game, and wildlife. And then President um, Teddy Roosevelt did become president. And so he was actually influenced maybe in some of those talks with John Muir. In 1903, he established the first, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was established. The first refuge was actually in Pelican Island um, in Florida. In 1905, the U.S. Forest Service uh, was established and actually has a connection to North Carolina. At that time, the Biltmore Estate was being built by um, Mr. George Vanderbilt. He was trying to increase the trees around that area in Asheville so that when he looked out into the, his, off his porch, one of his many porches there, he, the timber would be replaced. And he had a, a forester named of Gifford Pinchot. But at the time, Teddy Roosevelt was thinking of getting this started as well. And Mr. Pinchot did end up going to be the first secretary of the U.S. Forest Service and left Mr. Vanderbilt some other ideas to, to take his place. And then with all of these, um, and then finally, excuse me, in 1916, Wood, President Woodrow Wilson signed the bill into law that established the National Park Service eventually and on August 25th of 1916. These efforts all helped to protect, protect hunting and habitat loss, which included benefits to the beaver. So why bother? Why should we care? At the beginning of the 20th century, only about 100,000 beaver remained. The fish and game agencies had began to take notice, realizing the significance to the um, ecosystem that beavers had played a part in and how it had started to change. The beaver works as a keystone species in our ecosystem. They are flood mitigators. If there's beavers around, just the sound of water will put them to work. Dams will create multiple runoff streams and it'll slow down flooding. There are wildfire protectors. Keep understory because of the waterways that are created, the marshes that are created from the beavers, it helps keep the understory wet. And that increased water table in some areas of the country, these beavers have created streams or marshes. And in those areas, it's a natural way of keeping the soil moist so that fires do not occur. The UK has actually introduced beavers just for that reason, to help decrease wildfires. There are wildlife managers. 
They're creating ponds, they're creating marshes. You know, at the PD, we have numerous marshes that we have to create. We have to flood those areas out uh, so that the migrating waterfowl can come. If we had left the beavers alone, they would have created their own. We would have had those marsh, those natural marshes areas. Wetlands create, created are known to be rich in nutrients. The growth of plants brings in other species of mammals, amphibians, and birds. They are dam building, water storing, wetland creating engineers all on their own. And all duties that we have to perform manually at our wildlife refuges. Natural resources agencies actually took notice. Um, in the Adirondacks, probably one of the largest uh, reintroductions of the beaver uh, in the Adirondack area of New York in the late 1800s, they were down to just five colonies of beavers. In 1901 to 1907, there were 34 beavers were relocated from the US and Canada. And by 1915, the New York population of, of beavers was at 15,000. FDR in 1933, uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, and due to the um, depression uh, had created the CCC, the Conservation Civilian Corps. One of the duties of the CCC was tracking soil erosion. And so he had noticed of what had occurred in the Adirondacks and actually introduced releasing over 600 beavers in both Californ in California, Wyoming, Oregon, and Utah. New deals that that was done with the beavers. It was estimated the beavers cost about five dollars a piece at that time um, to relocate, etc. The natural work done by the beavers and uh, the value of that during the Great Depression, it was later valued that those beavers were worth about three hundred dollars a piece because of what they had done to help rebuild. Um, some of those Martian and areas. To this day, there are actually local government agencies that have been begun to incorporate beavers in their restoration plans, in their urban areas, in their um, both rural and urban areas. It's a natural way to rebuild these uh, waterways. And there's no build bulldozers and no building permits needed. Beavers today face no fear of extinction. Uh, around 15 million um, are in the continental United States at this point. Uh, that's a far cry from the 400 million that we had. However, they are not worried about being extinct. So this kind of shows how dams help. Um, a stream without beavers. The water is flowing high during heavy rainfall and can cause flooding downstream. With beavers, a dam is, they have made a dam which helps um, create a pool in which they build their lodge. A series of dams and pools slows and diverts water flow so it can be more absorbed by the land and help eliminate that erosion. It is a natural habitat for creating for fish, um, creating for plants, creating for the um, more fertile soil where we can have all kinds of organisms that will be able to live and survive in that. This is actually an example of something that happened out at the PD National Re Refuge. Um, the picture to the left was actually um, an area off of Dennis Road in Anson County, um, 
in Wadesboro along the edge of the PD National Wildlife. And so the picture to the left was actually from 1993. And if you look, you see no um, waterway at all in that picture. However, the picture to the right was from 2018. Beavers have created a dam in just the small waterways that uh, run through there, uh, some of the tributaries of uh, the Brown River. And you can see that a pond has been created. So just a natural part of that. However, we can also go the other way. So the picture to the left, this area is at PD National Wildlife Refuge and it is actually called Beaver Pond. The picture to the left, you can see there was a large area, a pond. They were, there was fishing going on out there for many, many years. That picture um, to the left was from 2005. The picture to the right is from 2018. And what happened here, and you see there's no longer, you can no longer see a pond. What happened here is the beavers left. They moved down the river, um, created some other, and all of these, it's hard to see. If you can see the picture on the left, you can see all the little tributaries that had happened off of the river. Um, but they left that main area and have gone into other areas um, around. And so now Beaver Pond no longer looks like it did in that picture. Instead, it looks like that. When we have beaver, um, when we have these marshy areas, there's an example of a beaver dam. It also brings in, is a natural habitat for a lot of animals um, that need and survive in that type of environment. Uh, this is out in, um, this is called Oxbow Bend in Grand Teton National Park. And if you, it's a definitely a natural habitat for moose. One of, the, um, one of the beautiful mammals that people are normally looking for when they are out in that area. I've got to get ahead here somewhere. So it's just an example of a beaver dam, or excuse me, a beaver lodge. And I think one of the, the people here had mentioned how when the, they saw the below the water, you see a beaver, has built this lodge and they actually need those water levels. They go up underneath that to get inside. It's a dome shaped structure. The exterior chamber is made of sticks and mud. It's about six to 40 feet high. And depending on the beaver in the colony, an average colony is about five to six adults. Uh, they're, um, they live in there, not only with the adults, they live with their current offspring. They have their previ previous yearlings. And around um, two years old, the beavers will end up leaving the, uh, that particular lodge to find a mate. Um, they start their own colony and may travel about five to six miles to set up. Um, they are highly territorial. Huh, I'm trying, yeah, I was, oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. So can we coexist? It really depends on how you look at the beaver. If you want to um, think of it that it is helping our environment, then yes, definitely we can coexist. Sometimes people are thinking they are more of a nuisance and they do cause some problems um, where there's flooding out. However, it's one of those natural uh, parts of our ecosystem 
that having them actually does have their benefits. And that is my all I've got. A lot of the information that I have uh, talked about is taken from this particular uh, publication, uh, a great book to give you a better understanding also of a different way to look at beavers. You're welcome. Does anyone in the room have any questions or anyone um, on the call? Yes. I'm wondering, do you know what their lifespan is? No, I do not. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know that. And then you said that second set of pictures you showed that they had moved on. Uh huh. The, did you do some, did y'all do something to entice them to move on? No. They on their own? No, they just moved on their own. Where Where's the pictures at again? Um, We'd have to share it again. Here's okay. Here's a question. So How to relocate? I do not have an answer <laughs> to that. Yeah. Um, I would imagine there are probably some farmers who would like to relocate them, but I really, I do not have an answer. I would say, um, just here in North Carolina, I would call, um, go to the North Carolina Wildlife uh, Resource Commission website. I believe you probably would find some of that information or an avenue to get that answer. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we can share. Did you want to share a picture? I was looking back at that picture that she was asking me about. Okay, let's see. Back there. Yeah, that one right there. I mean, I, and I can't point. Is it? It would screen share this so the people on the call know what we're talking, we're talking about. about. Too. Okay. Um, back here. So the question for those on the call, um, the question about this was, were the beavers actually relocated or did they move on their own or was something done mm -hmm. to make them move? No, yeah, you know, we we did not do anything. You know, we are a federal land. We are a wildlife refuge there. Um, so we are going to let the beavers do what the beavers are going to do. Like I said, it helps us. It helps the uh, migration. You know, we, we end up manually uh, flooding out areas on the wildlife refuge for the migration of the birds. So um, we want those wetlands. Yet, for whatever reason, these beavers just moved along and you know you can see all these the the other waterways that were created off of this this is actually comes this particular waterway here comes off of the pd river um which is in a and that's in a general area that we do flood out uh during this time of year that we have them the migrating waterfowl so you flooded in addition to what they were already doing yeah, not, um, it's over a little bit from where this is, but not very far. Uh, the PD River is kind of up at the top of where this picture is. Um, that area we didn't do anything with. I mean, that, that already had been a pond. There is an area on the refuge um, that we are public land. We manage the land differently. There are areas that are leased out to farmers. And so during the summer months, that is uh, crops. And then they, uh, when they're done harvesting the crops, it's usually, you know, obviously in the fall. And then about after deer hunting season, things like that, um, during, after deer hunting season, we actually shut off that area and we start flooding where the crops had been. We flood that from the PD River. And that's and like I said, and they they see thousands of migrating birds coming through there. I want to say one thing about yeah. it. So from my reading and understanding, um, they often leave when they run out of a food source, and they aren't happy with whatever food is there anymore. Hmm. And beavers actually, um, they have food preferences just like we do, mm -hmm. and they don't like pine trees. Right. They will pull the pine trees, so you'll see where they like chew around it. Mm -hmm. They will not actually like. They're only doing that to get rid of them to kill them so that they can't keep producing more pine trees. Right. Um, uh -huh. So I mean, you can kind of see in that picture. It makes sense to me. Yeah. Like, there's not a lot left, and maybe all that was pine trees. Yeah. Really yeah. Um, so they moved on. 
we're in North Carolina, so we have pines, you know. So, um, yeah. And I mean, they'll also eat water lilies, cattails. You know, they will eat sorbine and corn, which that is the crops that um, that land is leased in, in that general area is not very far. They are definitely there. Yeah, the wildlife manager was out there today in another area on the refuge. He was having to remove some of the dams um, because it was causing some troubles. So, you know, we had to. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, how big do beavers grow? So they get to be about 50 pounds. Okay. So um, that's a pretty good size. I mean, even with a dog, if you think about a dog, it's a 50 pound dog could be about that big. So, yeah. You know, maybe a golden retriever, a little bit smaller. You know, thank him pretty big. We've got a question here in the chat yes, as well. Um, Greg is asking, I have beavers on my property and concerned about the trees they are taking down. Do you know how destructive they are as a colony and how concerned concerned they should be? Well, beavers can cause damage, you know. Um, again, I don't have an answer in how you can um, remove them. Uh, there are, as a, as a property owner, you can um, do things yourself. However, I would again suggest looking at the North Carolina Wildlife um, Resource Commission website and they'll have some of those answers for you, so. Yes, ma'am. If there are special trees you really want to save, you can put fencing around them, but just make sure it's not keeping the tree from, you know, growing. Okay. So one of the members uh, that is sitting here um, in our presentation, she said if there are specific trees that you are interesting in interested in protecting, you can put fencing around them. Um, you know, close to it, but just making sure that there's room for, for the growth of the tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. In North Carolina, where did you find, so, so, Is, is that the commission one, the North Carolina Wildlife Commission? It just says NorthCarolinaWildlife.org. It, it includes tracking. Okay, so North Car somebody here has looked up. Um, Google North Carolina Beaver Management Assistance. Okay, so she Googled North Carolina Beaver Management Assistance, and it came up, and it's giving you... Um, guidance in what to do with them if you're wanting to to remove them. Did you, and you may have mentioned this, um, that beavers were extirpated, so they weren't in North Carolina, and I think in the 1980s, they finally brought them back. At one point, though, they were hunted to extinction in North Carolina. North Carolina? Yeah, no, I did not know. They were not in existence, and so that's, they try to manage them, but mm -hmm. they don't want to, Right, right. For the and that's as I'm saying, there's reasons that we want the beavers to to help in this area. So, no, I I did not know they brought them back in 1980. I think it was in the 80s. Yeah. So, um, Brent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's checking their sources here. So Brianna was saying that in the. Uh, okay. So essentially in North Carolina, they were extinct. Okay, so until the 1980s, you're, you're saying they were, okay. We're, we're getting that source, um, sorry, but that they were extinct in, and again, if they were as successful as what I explained the Adirond New York was with just um, bringing in 34 beavers, um, they, the population certainly increased pretty quickly. Huh? The last report of a native beaver in North Carolina was 1897. Okay, so the, the native beaver. So, so, they brought in more, but I'm, I'm like, well, that makes sense about the 1800. I mean, again, 
the eight, the late 1800s is when we were having the for 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 apocalypse. And maybe the 80s was the last like big push that they did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can't find that now, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and like I said, that makes sense in general in the history timeline that I was saying, the late 1800s. Yeah, yeah, the late 1800s, you know, because I'm sure the colonists, I'm speculating, but I would believe the colonists were getting the pelts here and moving, you know, having to move farther and farther, especially because they were obviously the colonies, the first colonies were here and to get those pelts to send back to, to um, England. That was I was several years old. In 1939, 29 beavers were obtained from Pennsylvania and released in North Carolina. Okay. So it was 1939. Okay, 1939, they were reintroduced. Um, hey, Brianna? Yeah. yeah. Could you just move a little closer when you're speaking? It's oh, a little okay. hard to hear you through the, through the Zoom audio. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that was another um, I can just walk yep. over. But in, so we were discussing the extirpation of beavers from um, North Carolina in the, I think it was 1897. So they no longer existed in North Carolina. Um, and then in 1939, um, they were brought from Pennsylvania back into North Carolina as an effort to repopulate. So there are a lot of um, programs now, like we don't want to get rid of our beavers because we mm -hmm. brought them back on purpose because mm -hmm. um, they're great ecosystem um, creators, essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, wetland creators. Yes, yeah. managers. Yeah, wetland managers, as we said. Mm -hmm. So when, when they trap them for the pets, what do they do with the rest of the beavers? Are they edible? Again, I am just speculating. <laughs> so the question was, when they trapped them for the pelts, what what were they doing with the rest of the animal? I, mean, I can't imagine Native Americans just kill something for the hive. Exactly. Else with the rest of them. Yeah, that's what I was going to speculate. You know, I would imagine the Native Americans were using every part of that animal. Um, they're also, I believe... And again, just because I did not look into into that more on that part of it, the um, I believe that uh, they used them. They actually used um, the scent for perfumes. Huh. So, I guess it could be a musk. Mm -hmm, yeah, use the musk. Mm -hmm. Okay. I might have to Google that. No, I'm and <laughs> the perfume, it was, yeah, uh, I did see, a, I saw a small, but uh, you might want to Google about eating. Do you, can you eat? Sad. Yeah. Which is used in medicine, perfume, and food flavoring. What is it called? Is it castorium? Castorium. Mm -hmm. But it's used in medicine, perfume, and food flavoring. Okay. Um, and it's used in medicine, perfume, and food flavoring. Okay. Um, but they do it in the animals. They're okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would I'm like, think. Can I eat a, a raccoon or a I'm, possum? Yeah. Uh, I would imagine. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. So I want to just say to Robert mm -hmm. yeah. on the um, call, he said, I live on, I live inside of Old Cary. I've seen signs of beavers on and off for 15 years, um, but they hire someone to kill them almost every year, but they are here. So unfortunately, a lot of people do kill the beavers mm -hmm. just because they're, they are hard to relocate unless you relocate them mm -hmm. to like a completely different area. Yeah. Um, Cause they are attracted to the sound of water. And they're very territorial. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they are going to, and again, because be of, out. well, and as I said, their family, you know, the, the offspring of the beavers are, are there for about two years and they all live together in that colony. So uh, once the, they're about two, they do go off and they start their own colony. They don't come back, but you know, they are, they are around. So if the city's doing that, that's sad. <laughs> so, but there are 
again, farmlands that, um, you know, just even around, around us, uh, one side of the ref, one side of the road is the refuge. The other side of the road is um, private farmland. And if the beavers are, have set a dam, made a dam on our refuge side, it can cause backup into the private farm farmer's land. And so then we do need to, because it is on our, on the public land, we do need to remove that so that we are not creating a problem. It's not creating a problem, but we not are, we are not removing the beaver. We're just taking down the dam that they've created and then they're going to go find another spot to, to replace it. Hmm. Now, I'm assuming y'all have, have it set up when y'all do flooding, similar to the way they do rice paddy, so that you can let the water in to hold it for a while and then release it, or how does that? Yes, yes. I, I encourage you to come out and, and see the refuge if you haven't been there. Um, yeah, okay. So I, I encourage you to come out to PD National Wildlife Refuge. We are only about a 40 minute drive from this facility where I'm standing in today. Um, we are actually 8,700 acres uh, off of 50. Yep, we are 8,700 acres. So we, uh, our main entrance um, into the refuge is off of Route 52. And we have an area you drive back into there, just pulling off of 52. You'll see our sign, PD National Wildlife Refuge. And we're about a half mile back in there is our office building. Um, you are welcome to come into that. We do have a small uh, displays of some of the mammals uh, that have been, that are found there on the refuge. Um, also some mounts of the different types of ducks or waterfowl um, through there. Some beautiful pictures uh, that have been taken by some nature photographers. And by there we do offer, we are a public land that is open to uh, the public for all types of recreational activities. So we have fishing. We have ponds where you can go fishing. We have um, Air, yeah, we have hunting seasons. Um, we do the information uh, for our different, uh, our hunting seasons. We do follow North Carolina rules and regulations as far as um, hunting licensing. However, we are a federal facility. So we have different, um, our seasons are a little bit different than the state of North Carolina. So important that you pay attention to that. Um, that information can be found on the um, FWS for Fish Wildlife Service, fws.gov, and then PD. It gives you all that information of um, our hunting permits, our fishing permits, our seasons. And right there by our office, off of 52, it is called Wildlife Drive. It's about a two mile drive around a marsh area. And so what, in answer to your question, even in there, like we've had a lot of rain here in the last couple of weeks, which we want the rain, um, obviously that helps flood the areas out um, quicker. The area right about around our refuge behind us, um, they have ways that they do control and then they can open up valves to, to let it naturally release when the time comes. And so that's what they do um, over the area where we flood from the PD is off of Grassy Island Road. Uh, which again, like I said, we are 8,700 acres and that area directly connects into the PD River. That's the area that we flood in. But during this time, the migrating waterfowl, um, we, it is closed um, for that uh, because we are a refuge for them. So, um, but even in the spring, we get a lot of uh, migrating songbirds. Um, the Audubon Society comes out a lot, you know, photographers. Um, right now, we actually have a couple tundra swans on one of our um, ponds, and yeah, yeah. So you just, you know, it's. I've been, I've worked in public lands for the last ten years between the National Park Service and now with Fish and Wildlife Service, and that's what I, I've said. Um, you know, get a lot of questions of where are the where are the animals, where are the bears, where are the moose, where you know now it's where are the birds. Um, Unfortunately, they're going to be where they want to be any given day. You know, it's it's not something that 
we can direct. So, you know, they'll, they'll be where they want to be. So it's exciting to see the tundra swans. Do we have moose here? We do not. Where I, I was, <laughs> no, I was in Yellowstone. I was in Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park. So, you know, I, I've gone from getting those questions about the elk, the moose, the bears, to now different types of birds, you know, but yeah, but there's a lot more birds to identify than there were in those large mammals. So, uh, I noticed in your brochure that you do the certain areas where you do prescribe birds. We do. Mm -hmm. so, you, any idea what kind of nature you're talking about there? Because I can't imagine it's the whole place. It's so, oh, no. Yeah. The, the, so, we actually, yeah. So, um, prescribed burns are very important, actually. Um, we did the, they don't, no, they do not do it all at times. It's different plots that they have set up. Um, and so, for instance, they just did some prescribed burns this time of year in the spring, um, as we start getting into the spring, it's about March, is, March or so. Um, they'll, we'll start doing those prescribed burns. Um, last year, I don't know exactly, it, it may have only been a few hundred acres that they had done. Um, however, um, not only is that good for the, um, the natural um, nutrients that go back into the ground, um, help grow a healthier forest. Um, it also, and, and we had some quail hunting going on in the fall here, there was quail hunting and I ran into some of the quail hunters and they were very happy that we had done the control burns this year because it had been a few years. It just makes a better environment for the quail and, and better for the hunters too, you know, so it's all all that natural process that, which is why we do allow hunting. I'm assuming it's a certain amount of acreage every, if memory serves correctly, it's been like three to five Right. They have a burn plan. Yes, they have a burn plan. Um, you know, so it does come back and, um, but it had been a few years since they had, had done that. So last year was one of them. And I know they're already um, going to be talking about doing, they're already talking about doing some this year too, um, from getting assistance from one of our sister refuges in South Carolina. So. Denise? Yeah. Uh, more questions? Could, you re could you just repeat some of the questions that are coming in? We just, it's kind sure. of hard to hear. Thank you. <laughs> and I guess I've confused people. I'm seeing some of the questions. I said moose in North Carolina. No, I did not say there was any moose in North Carolina. Um, I had worked out, I had worked out West um, in Wyoming. And so there, there was moose out there. And so that's, I, I, and I was answering a question about people ask where they're going to see things and and so I was comparing the fact of when I worked out there people were asking where's the moose where's the bear and here it's where's any particular type of bird you know that people are wanting to see so um and the other question that we had just had I'm sorry was about um control burns so they I have some brochures here from the refuge and they were asking um you know, we are 8,700 acres. How do we, what do we do with the burns? Um, this last year, we, I think we did about two or 300 acres. Uh, and that also, you know, control burns are important. It helps put nutrients back into the ground. It helped make a better hunting environment, um, just a, an, a habitat environment for the quail and so forth. So that's why it was important. And we'll be doing more of them this year too. It's this time of year that they start doing them. Yes, ma'am. Did you know that beavers can share their lodge with muskrats? No, I did not. So um, participant here asked if I knew that beavers could share their lodges with muskrats. Nope. Now muskrats are a real pain to have. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I'm surprised, like I said, the beavers are very terrible. I'm surprised they allow, you know, that they do that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, because they are territorial. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a benefit to it. A mutual beneficial thing and they wouldn't let it happen. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they help them build it. I don't know or take care of it. <laughs> Most rats are really good at digging holes. Yeah. Into the dam. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Is there any other questions? Can I say one thing? 
Sure. Uh, we have a critter cam that we move around our property. Mm -hmm. And one night, no lie, at least 40 trips of fever, out fever. And wow. Out, um, and <laughs> a lot of those branches and the cold mm -hmm. water for mm -hmm. the winter, you know, like yeah. the Busy as, a beaver. busy as a beaver like they say a participant has uh, a beaver lodge um on her property and said in one evening just with um a camera um saw about 40 trips going back and forth so they were they were doing what they're supposed to do i guess so busy as a beaver and they did grow all our pine trees that were on that mm -hmm. they don't like them I can tell. yeah they don't like pine trees okay <laughs> okay no Thank you. No. Any more questions? Then go ahead and right. If no one on the call has any other questions, then we will um, go ahead and close this session. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, and if you have any other questions, just send them to Tara or Madison. Or um, if you have my email, you can send them to me, and we'll mm -hmm. make sure that they get answered. Thank you. <laughs>